We're joined in uh, this portion of our program. I'm Bob Salter, and this should be a fun discussion with um, the guest who is joining us. Now, in his background, he's been uh, seen on Showtime, Comics Unleashed. He's uh, literally been heard on hundreds of uh, radio stations across the country. Uh, he has a background which is uh, multicultural in nature, as a Mexican mother, a Jewish father, and he is uh, somebody who can address an awful lot of topics. He's written for George Carlin's Laugh.com and appeared on a variety of different uh, TV shows. He's a very funny individual. He has a new CD out called Chucklelicious, which I think is a very interesting uh, title for a CD. We'll get into exactly why that title was chosen as well. Mark Yaffe is joining us on our program. Uh, Mark, it's so nice to have you with us. Great to be here, Bob, and uh, happy holidays. And happy holidays to you. Um, hopefully the uh, holiday period of time has um, treated you well. Got off to a great start. I did the uh, the Thanksgiving. You know, I am native. We still I still did the traditional Thanksgiving. Uh, ate the uh, ate turkey, watched football, which was a lot of fun. Last year, uh, the Cowboys uh, actually lost to the Redskins, and the you know, Redskins haven't beaten the Cowboys much in the last two hundred years. So. <laughs> of course, you know, I, I I naturally have to ask you about this whole discussion about the. Um, concept of changing the name of the Redskins team. Where do you fall on that? Well, I think uh, I think in this day and age, I know we have some PC uh, fatigue, but uh, uh, I, I think it's going to happen eventually. I don't know how long it's going to take, but um, you know, I, am, I just think that the tide, of, the tide of history is on the side of the name change. I don't know what they're going to change it to. I'm thinking maybe, you know, in the spirit of compromise, we, we keep half the name. So, you know, they can still keep the skins part, and then maybe Native Americans or some other group, the fans can pick the first part. Maybe we'd change them to the, the uh, munchkins, the rumpelstiltskins, the foreskins. I don't know. But it's, well, you know, they said that the name was to honor Native Americans. I'm like, hey, well, let's, let's honor someone else. Maybe try honoring Congress, change it to the snakeskins. <laughs> okay. The whole thing of um, being of a background that, as I mentioned, is uh, multicultural in uh, nature. What was that like growing up in the household you were in? Well, it was kind of odd because I didn't know uh, what my background, my ethnic background was until I was like 25. So uh, when my birth mother actually tracked me down when I was 25 and, and she told me that, you know, I'm actually uh, um, Mexican and Irish and, and Navajo. So I, I didn't know about my native background because it turns out all those years growing up playing Cowboys and Indians, I was suiting up for the wrong team. <laughs> and when did your love of making people laugh or that ability to make people laugh start to develop? I think uh, I, I, if I look back over the next, I was just growing up, you know, in the, the 70s and I, I was a big fan of Flip Wilson and All in the Family and, and MASH, all those great sitcoms. I always loved writing, and and it was always in the back of my head. I did some high schools, you know, I was on the sports editor, and I liked to write. Uh, and, my, you know, I made my buddies laugh. You know, we hung out in sports and had a lot of fun. And uh, then pretty much uh, in my uh, mid-30s, I'm kind of a late bloomer to comedy. I was teaching uh, traffic classes, traffic violator school in California. When you get tickets... You go to class, and I actually owned a school. And people said, "Oh, you're, you know, you're funny. You should consider doing comedy." And I'm, I uh, ended up in Sacramento taking a comedy uh, workshop, and the instructor just uh, liked my stuff, and he asked me to go out on the road with him. And then I started getting more gigs, and here I am, uh, 15 years later. I'm, I'm 15 years into the 50-year plan. <laughs> What's it like working as a comedian? It's. Uh, it, a little bit uh, uh, ADD, you know, you have to be your own booker and uh, promoter and travel agent. Uh, you know, I, I do have a manager now, and, uh, you know, I, have, I work with a publicist, and you know that, but it's 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 self-employment at its worst, because uh, at, at the end of the day, you know, you, you, you work at a job, every job is a job interview, and, and they uh, audition for your next, next job, and it's just, it, it's gone from... Uh, the boom of the 90s to now, it's just like a boom where everyone wants to do, I and mean, so many people want to do stand-up, but the, the number of spots available have just kind of stagnated, and, and uh, it, it makes for it makes for an interesting uh, uh, 
economics you know some months are just awesome and you're you're busy as heck and the next month you're like okay well what am i doing now you know maybe i should have gotten that maybe i should have gotten that day job 20 years ago <laughs> <laughs> what is it that makes a good stand up performance well i don't know that's like that's like asking a musician i guess what makes what makes a good you know musical concert there's so many different tastes i really think my my success is uh and just, you know, an ability to relate to people. Um, you know, a good comedian has to be able to read their audience. Um, you got, I, I like to push the envelope, but just, you know, not just uh, drive people to uh, the point where they're uh, disgusted or, or offended. You know, I mean, I think, I'm, especially being, able, being part Native, being able to push the Native envelope. You know, like I'll joke about, you know, hey, I love, you know, I'll be an audience and say, I love this audience. You know, you, you guys can take a country, you can even take a joke. And, <laughs> and people, you know, just get responses like that. It's, it's always, uh, I, I always get a kick out of it. But I think it's keeping the audience in the loop and, and, and letting them realize that, uh, hey, you're, you're in on the joke too, and you're no, I'm no smarter than you are. I'm just, uh, I'm just bringing you along for the ride. How do you suggest, or how do you explain how one recovers when a joke bombs? I just, I just uh, keep shooting them, you know, just blasting away. I'm a, I'm kind of a rapid fire comedian that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll joke it off sometime. I'll say, you know, I, like the other night, I had some joke. I just tried a new joke. I just, they just stared at me. I said, you guys, you guys are, you guys are looking at me like the, the Pope at a wet t-shirt contest, or I'd come up with something. You know, it's, it's amazing. But the, the, the brain will just concoct a, you know, a, an escape hatch. You know, it's, uh, that, that's part of the fun of it. It's, and people enjoy the improv part of it too, because. You know, we've seen so much, everything's so staged now, you know, even our reality shows are staged, and, you know, you look at, look at Duck Dynasty, everyone's like, oh, yeah, that's, man, that's amazing how spontaneous that is. Well, yeah, the, the interviews are spontaneous, but a lot of the reality shows are, are actually pretty scripted, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, coaching and stuff going on, so. You know, comedy, keeps, comedy still keeps its freshness, one of the few, industry, you know, few entertainment uh, outlets where people can really still have a, a freedom of speech. That whole appreciation for um, real comedic performances, um, what I guess what keeps that alive? Uh, you know, you, you have so many different reality shows, uh, presentations and the like anymore. In a way, has that watered down the appreciation that there is for true comedy? I, I think this, the, the uh, oversaturation of entertainment has, has hurt comedy a bit because people have so many other outlets and we're such an ADD society. But at the same time, when you can get people into a live audience where you get so many different you know, backgrounds and ethnicities and people attending the show and bringing them together to slap as a group is, is really cathartic. I think it just brings people together. That's awesome. It's, when you're in an audience, it doesn't matter you know, how rich or poor you are, how how drunk or sober you are. I mean, if, if it's funny and you're all laughing together, it's, it's a, you know, it's a really a, a unifying energy. And I, I think that's, that's an awesome thing. Cause you know, you, you don't see too many uh, people in the audience going after each other at a comedy club. They might heckle the comic, but people, you know, they, they just somehow get along in a comedy club, which is, I think it's awesome. Comedy still has a, that effect. The other, the other thing about comedy is we can say what people are thinking and, you know, they can't just go blurting out at work. On their, at the, you know, at the uh, airport, you know what they really think of TSA, or you know how how really crappy they think the uh, the airlines treat people. And when it comes to handling hecklers, what's the first thing that you keep in mind? Well, the first thing I keep in mind is how drunk are they? <laughs> are they going to be even rational to deal with? There's just so many variety of people coming at you. you know, one is okay. I have to keep this line because these other people pay a lot of money. And they didn't pay to hear the heckler. And if you hammer the heckler too hard, the audience can turn in and say, well, this guy's been kind of a jerk. That person didn't deserve it. And if you're, if you're too nice to them and they, you give them a window, they just keep coming back at you. So it, you just try to thread the needle and, and, and shut them down in a nice way. And like I said, my, my style is just, hey, I got, I got way more material. You know, I'll say, you know, if you're sitting there, you, you, you know, you pound the drinks, I'll tell the jokes. That usually shuts them down there. And then, uh, We'll just, we'll just see where it goes. If they want to go toe-to-toe, then, hey, we can do that, too. But uh, I, I tend to, you know, I, I like I like to uh, have a non-adversarial relationship with my audience. Some comedians really enjoy, uh, you know, uh, stirring up the hecklers and, and going, going into the audience. And 
that's that's been uh, good and bad in comedy. Cause some people are like so terrified of that the uh, uh, comedian is going to pick on them. Like, well, they're only picking on people who are really causing you know trouble and and off and off. So you don't have anything to worry about if you're just sitting there enjoying a drink. Do you look for? Do you feed off the reaction of the audience? Oh, sure. You know, you can't help that. You know, especially if, you know, if an audience is uh, going with you on a joke or something's happened spontaneous. You just you know you run on that. I think audiences. Uh, Audiences are very smart now. You know, you can't you can't just get away with uh, just stock material. You, you, it's harder. You know, people want to see some live, you know, some improv and stuff that's uh, directly related to that show versus just you reciting some jokes that you did on a CD, you know, two years ago or, or six months ago. Mark Yaffe is talking with us on our program. Uh, Mark, um, in his background, has appeared on a number of um, different uh, programs. He's, um, been, as I mentioned, beginning of our discussion on uh, Showtime as well. Now, you have your inaugural CD, which has the title of Chucklelicious. That came out in November. Why that title? You know, I just it's just popped into my head. I said, man, I always, I always describe my comedy kind of as a ADD comedy buffet because I cover so many topical and relationship. I don't tend to stay in one genre. So I said, you know, hey, it was, you know, the food, the food theme stuck in my head. So I, I like the, the thing of laughing. I thought it was, you know, I, thought, I like the idea of uh, the, the tasty idea. So I'll just throw a chuck delicious. And uh, it's basically an accumulation of um, thousands of miles on the road and dozens of notebooks and years and in, in, in hundreds of shows and comedy clubs. And I decided to pretty much prove one thing. I have really poor time management skills. <laughs> This time of the year, everybody starts to focus as well uh, during this uh, holiday time on looking ahead to the new year, to 2014, and making those New Year's resolutions. Um, First of all, you have some New Year's resolutions that are guaranteed to fail. Is that right? Yeah, I figured, you know what? We, we always do these things. I say, let's get them out of the way early. I'm going to make my New Year's resolution. I probably won't stick with it. So I'm going to make some really, what I think are simplistic but very unattainable New Year's resolutions. Like this year, I've, uh, I've resolved I'm, I'm no more riding elevators, which is going to be a little difficult. I do live on the 22nd floor. That would be difficult. Yeah, instead of texting, uh, only send the uh, candy grams. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I will be driving the speed limit in the fast lane at all times, so uh, <laughs> that, that could get a little dicey. Uh, I want to teach your grandma to twerk. Uh, another one that is pre- pretty much guaranteed to fail is uh, vacuuming out the little crack between my driver's seat and the gear shifter. Oh, definitely, car. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and this one, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to make this happen. Is I file my income taxes on January 1st. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, the other one is I think I'm going to cancel my cell phone and only use pay phones. <laughs> Does anybody even remember pay phones? My phone went out. Uh, this was about six months ago. I was working in San Antonio, and my, my, my cell phone died, and my carrier at the time uh, didn't have an outlet in, uh, in Texas. So I'm, I'm walking around the city looking for a pay phone. And you can find pay phones, but... You know, which, you know, few and far between, and the ones that actually work or act, well, you can get a dial phone or actually accept a coin or the buttons aren't glued shut. It's, it's, uh, it, you have a better chance of, of pretty much getting a free flight to Mars. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, those resolutions being guaranteed to fail, do you actually make a New Year's resolution? No, you know what? I, I'm just, uh, my, I, I try to have some goals, you know, in 2014, I'm, you know, I'm going to shoot, go for shooting a DVD. I want to, uh, I'm working on a reality show with my friend. Uh, we, we have a producer, it's uh, called Mending Fences, so we're going to try to put that together. It's basically, he's a contractor, and I, I'm doing the mediation, and we're going to uh, we're going to basically take feuding neighbors that are fighting over, you know, common property issues, you know, the fence, the tree knocking the fence over, and the, the uh the, crumb, the, the ivy that's crawling up and ruining the paint in the neighbor's house, and we're going to get them together and, and sort it out and have some laughs. And he's, a, he's a comic as well as a contractor, so you know, we're going to do that. Uh, I worked at the DMV, a driving examiner for the state of California for uh, like seven and a half years, 
Oh, that must and, have been fun. Oh, yeah, right? From, from DMV to comedy, can you think of, like, a, <laughs> a, a wider opposite, polar opposites of career paths? You know, I, don't, I can't think of one. And so I finished the sitcom for that, and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, writing a pilot for that, and hopefully that's kind of a uh, we'll see. You know, basically get on TV, get the word out. Because unfortunately, we know now, unless you're a Kardashian or a crazed politician, pretty much, uh, you know, it's hard to get coverage in this media world, but... Uh, and I, and I don't have a beard, so I don't think I'll be replacing the Duck Dynasty folks anytime soon. <laughs> now, would do you actually write every day, or try to write material every day? No, nah, I'm inconsistent. I, I have been lately because I've been doing a lot of promoting on my CD. So, um, you know, my, with me and, other, you know, public folks are like, hey, can you talk about this and talk about that? So I think that helps. Like, you know, I, I've, I've actually come up with some ideas, uh, some replacements for the Duck Dynasty, because basically uh, there's a lot of rumors floating around that they're going to uh, jump ship on a &E. So I'm saying, you know what, we get with the Duck Dynasty um, clan, uh, the theme, we, we need to replace it with some similar theme shows. So I'm thinking, like, uh, um, we take uh, a couple that really love farmyard animals and uh uh, and eggs, and, and and then we follow them in their chicken laying chicken laying empire. We're going to call it the Clark Dynasty. <laughs> and then I have another one. We're going to follow a, a fleet of rotor rooter trucks emptying septic tanks uh, down the South Alabama. That's going to be Muck Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And then my my other one. This will be Canada because we don't want the Canadians to feel left out. Uh, the McDermott family up there in Thunder Bay, Ontario. They're going to manufacture uh, hockey equipment from their uh, cabin. We're going to call that Puck Dynasty. I could see that one coming. Right? That was, that was like a bad slap shot, I know. <laughs> or maybe we just turn the camera on Congress and call it Schmuck Dynasty. <laughs> Mark Yaffe talking with us on our program. <laughs> it's a very interesting discussion. His new CD is called Chucklelicious. Uh, his website is Laugh with Mark. And that's Mark is M A R C. Laugh with Mark, all is one word, dot com. Mark is uh, kind enough to talk with us and share some thoughts. Certainly, I would say to you, first of all, thank you for your time with us um, today and um, keep plugging away. Keep plugging well, I away. I appreciate it. I, mean, and, and I, hope you, I hope you have a great New Year's and uh, much success in 2014. And, uh, Hopefully we'll uh, we'll do this again sometime. Thank you, and I think your words also can be inspiring uh, to some of those people who would love to do this uh, for a living. Hey, you know what? I think that you never know because I mean, my family always looked at me like, "What? Well, you're doing what? You're going to be a comedian?" They just they never quite took that seriously. I mean, if you if you really you, know, you have a love for making people laugh, you really like to laugh. You know, write that stuff down. You know, study study some comics. Go hit an open mic. Start with two or three minutes, and whatever you do, don't invite your family and friends the first three or four times. That's <laughs> that's the number one mistake. Because once once you lose them, they, your support group's gone, and you'll be back to uh, you'll be back to singing karaoke. <laughs> very good advice, Mark. Thank you very much for joining us on our program. Thank you, Bob.